Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2. John Coleman and I are here with our favorite food guy and uh, just all around really terrific guy, the virtual gourmet, John Mariani. Hi, John. Hello, good morning. Hey, food guy. <laughs> I'm my pal. John, I was, uh, I'm sure this is not an, un, uh, uh, not an uncommon experience, but I was talking to somebody about uh, recently uh, foods that I hated as a kid that I mm. love as an adult, one of which is uh, uh, fish and clam chowder um, and things like that. But there's also a whole category of foods uh, that I loved as a kid that I still have a memory of. In other words, it's it's somewhere it's in my head. It's it's um, uh, certain Clark bars, if you remember the candy bar Clark bar, um, things like that. And oh, and um, like bar. Yeah, and 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 I, somehow a lot of that stuff is not the same as an adult. So it's kind of the yin and yang of uh, childhood versus adult tastes. Now I know our taste buds change, but somehow I wonder if the food isn't changing as well. Alas, my answer must be yes. But let me begin by saying that you do remember, because it's indelible, those foods that you ate as a child, largely because you ate them every day. You know, you're lucky enough to remember like hot dogs or, or, or hamburgers. Yes. Or, yeah whatever, but you remember the specific taste of those your mother made. Now, when it comes to Milky Way bars, when it comes to um, any of the candies or the Twinkies and so forth, or a Nathan's hot dog, you or a Walter's hot dog in our case, um, yes. Yes. very, very strongly. And there's, I'll get into the biological reasons for that uh, in a moment, but yes, um, so much of that, all of it has changed. Um, I once several years ago was dining with a marketing director at uh, Campbell Soups. And I said, you know, I have to tell you that this last week, maybe preparing for this interview, that uh, I hadn't had Campbell's soup in uh, 20 years. And I had made it with a grilled cheese sandwich. And I opened the can, poured it in. I said, it didn't taste anything like I remember. Am I just being a nostalgic old food? And she leaned in and she says, no, it's, just, it's been changed. I said, why would you change? A classic recipe, she says, because to put in the same quality of ingredients that we used to use in the 1950s when you were a kid, and a can of Campbell's soup cost, I don't know, 11 cents a can, 19 cents a can. To do that, we had to up the price by several pennies, and our customers were not going to accept that. So we used cheaper ingredients, and I mean, I've seen this happen again and again and again. My, my, uh, sister-in-law is was in uh, marketing for uh, general foods and she talked about it all the time how <clears throat> okay get in the room uh, how, how can we reduce the cost on this how can we, oh, we don't have to use real chocolate do we we can use uh, milk solids can't we um and that's the way that's the way it happens that's the way it happens on an especially if a big conglomerate takes over they're only interested in profits they're not interested and and they see they believe that um you and i and or don't remember what that stuff tastes like. And if we've been having it every day, biggest boffo, biggest example of idiocy was Coca-Cola changing the oh. formula for Coke, making new uh, Coke. Because yes. as they had done, they found out that mm, blind taste, some of our Coca-Cola drinkers prefer Pepsi because it's sweeter. So yeah. that's our sweeter. What a bomb. You know, uh, uh, John, you bring that up um, in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, I was uh, uh, in Australia off and on for a year and a half, uh, hoping to run a company over there. And um, I remember getting a can of Coke there. And it was for the first time in years that I could drink a can of Coke. And it tasted like the Coke that I grew up with. And the reason was they were one of the last places on earth were actually using sugar instead of a sugar substitute. And my wow. guest childhood memory got triggered by a taste that I hadn't tasted for years. And I used to be a big Coke drinker um, and regular Coke drinker. And just the, the difference between 
I guess the fructose or whatever kind of toast they use as opposed to the sugar was a, it just triggered something wonderful as a, a, a memory. Well, you are lucky on the West Coast, as I am here. Um, many, many, many Spanish markets still have Coke made with sugar. I, I have one here in New Rochelle, as a matter of fact. When I really feel like a, a six pack of Coke, I go over there. Um, the Spanish kind of refuse to, we do not like the fructose stuff. We take the sucrose away. No mas, no mas. You know? um, so try and you know, being in the Los Angeles area, Southern California, I'm sure you have access to that. Mm. The yeah, we do. The sweet issue gets to the biology of it. So let's get really serious. I don't have my glasses here. But um, <laughs> there is a reason <clears throat> that children crave sweetness. And studies have been done which can be referenced in. As a matter of fact, this, this topic I'm talking about in my virtual gourmet, which is free to anybody who goes to johnmariani.com. Studies have been <clears throat> done to show that the reason that babies, infants, like sugar is because there's sugar in mother's milk. And biology, mother nature, says these kids should be drinking mother's milk. So the sweetness component is something that draws them to it. It also gives them energy. Um, you also find that uh, children hate bitter because biologically, bitter in nature often means poison. So a child tastes something that's bitter, bleh, they go like that. Because down deep in their DNA and biology, it's telling this might be poison, this might be bad for me. Isn't that interesting? So um, we all have, we all start off with about 50,000 uh, taste buds. And over the years, they, that number doesn't change. <clears throat> now, by the time you're a teenager, you will have more sensitivity to more flavors. Um, so you've gotten over the bitter thing, and you're probably going to get over the sweet thing too much. But you are more willing to taste more flavors and more taste. So you're adding to your sense memory um, as you go along. And as you get older, as you say, John, you didn't like fish very much, but you learned to eat fish. Same with me. I didn't really like fish till I was like 19 years old when I ate it in Europe. I said, oh, this is what fish is supposed to taste like. I mean, literally, that's... I was in Harry's Bar in Venice and said, whoa, this is, this is really great. Uh, so, yeah, it changes. But as we get older into our 50s, we, uh, we have the same amount of taste buds, 50,000, but they degenerate, just like everything else, your eyesight, your hearing, so, so it degenerates. So you really do lose um, a lot of your ability to taste through your tongue and palate, uh, your nose too. Um, so when you can whiff something uh, and say, that doesn't smell the way I remember it, um, that's probably true because uh, it, it, you, you are not tasting it, which puts into some perspective wine tasters and professionals who contend that they can taste minute nuances in, in wines. One of the most famous uh, of them was a winemaker named Mike Gugic, who uh, was from Croatia, and he smoked like two packs of cigarettes a day. And he, <laughs> he could tend that he could oh, sniff out anything in a wine. Whether or not that is true, nobody really knows except he was a consultant at, at wineries. And he died at like the age of 85 or something, despite his smoking habits. Uh, <clears throat> but I mean, just think of it, putting, blanketing your tongue, your taste buds with tobacco is not going to be very good for your taste buds. Um, you know, oh, well, you learn to adapt. The body learns to adapt. The body doesn't want to adapt to things like that and said, okay, I'm going to adapt to his smoking two packs a day just so he can enjoy his milky way and his fettuccine Alfredo the way he always did. So that's, that's not true. So, yeah, when I said uh, the title of my article was the, when it comes to taste, the child is father to the man, which is a quote from, from Wordsworth, who says that depending on how you were raised as a child and what you liked as a child, you're going to be that way when you become an adult and, and a father yourself. Uh, kind of interesting. Well, that's my, an interesting uh, premise. When, I, when my, um, uh, there are certain childhood foods uh, that uh, when I tasted them as an adult, it brought back very fond memories of, uh, uh, particularly my, my father, uh, Swiss cheese, aged Swiss cheese. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be very good, but his craft Swiss cheese always brought back a very fond memory because that's what we had around the house. Uh, blue cheese and uh, orange marmalade and dry roasted peanuts. 
because those are the only kind of peanuts we ate. And just when I taste those things, it just brings back great memories. It's almost transporting me back to a really happy yeah. time. Well, you know, there's been reams of very boring, dull scholarship poured out on Marcel Proust, uh, the French author who went to his mother's one one uh, weekend and had, as an adult, and had her uh, Madeleine cookies, butter cookies, and lime tea. And this sent him into an absolute heaven that he says, oh, I remember, this is bringing back everything. And he wrote eight novels based on that one experience. <laughs> eight novels. And he did it. Oh, that's, you know, and, and the sentences go on. Oh, it's, it, it's, anyway, that's Marcel Proust, greatest of uh, 20th century French novelists, was turned on by his mamas, Mad uh, Madeleines and, uh, and sweet lime tea. Hmm. Well, we all know he had a mother problem, so let's not go too far there. Uh, John, this is uh, fascinating because it's so universal. Uh, I think everybody uh, is affected by their childhood tastes. And uh, uh, how astute of you to bring that up. Well, I'm a student pencil. I do remember that, and to this day, there are two things I gag on. One is peanut butter in a sandwich, peanut butter jelly sandwich, mm. and the other is canned tuna fish. And if you gave me one now and tied me to this chair, I'd throw up on you. Oh, but enough! Curiously enough, um, I eat Thai peanut sauce. I eat roasted peanuts. I will eat things swabbed, but give me just peanut butter. And it brings me right back to childhood. I must have gone to my friend's house and his mother served it and I got sick or something. And canned tuna, I always hated. But I eat, wow. tuna, I eat tuna sushi, I eat fresh tuna uh, otherwise. Um, and uh, love it, can't get enough of it. But those two things are clearly related to something that happened in my childhood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it must be because I've always held that... Uh... Nature's two most perfect foods are hot dogs and peanut butter. And, and for you combined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someday they're going to make a peanut butter hot dog for me. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, John, thanks so much for uh, letting us relive our childhood. My pleasure. And, um, and what a fascinating talk about, uh, about food and taste. Love it. Thanks. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.